Welcome to Lesson 3b, Reynolds Transport Theorem. In this lesson, we use Leibniz Theorem to derive the Reynolds Transport Theorem. We'll also discuss material volumes and show how the Reynolds Transport Theorem is a link between Lagrangian and Eulerian descriptions. We start with the 3D Leibniz Theorem, which we discussed in the previous lesson. In general, this volume V moves independently of the fluid. But let's discuss a special case known as a material volume. This is a volume that moves with the fluid. So UA is equal to U, where U is the fluid velocity, and UA is the velocity of any point along the surface area A of T. If this is our initial volume, or potato, which is now a material volume, and it's in a flow field where these are streamlines, so at some surface element, the velocity of that surface element is also equal to the velocity of the fluid at that point, which is what we said here. So as this blob of fluid moves and perhaps distorts, it moves everywhere with the flow. And dA in this integral up here is the outward normal vector. This material volume is a system. Some people call it a closed system which by definition always contains the same mass. Mass cannot escape or come into a system. And since our V of T is now a material volume, we use the notation capital D dt instead of D dt, as we did when we derived the material derivative in a previous lesson. This notation emphasizes that V is a material volume. For this special case, then, we rewrite this equation as this equation, you see that everything's identical except the capital D's here. This material volume that we drew is at some time t, and after it moves, this is at a later time. Let's also consider this a control volume. This control volume is the same green blob or potato that I drew at first at time t. So at this instant in time, since the control volume is the material volume, in other words, they're coincident or lie on top of each other, they're the same fluid, we can set the volume as the control volume and the area as the control surface. So in this equation, V of t on the right-hand side becomes the control volume, which is a function of time, and surface area A of the control volume we call the control surface, also a function of time. So equation 1 becomes equation 2 when we substitute Cs and Cv. Why didn't we change this volume, V, on the left side? The left-hand side is the material volume, and the right-hand side is the control volume. But now we argue that this equation 2 is valid at any instant in time. This is a key to our argument, and we can say this because Ua equal U at this instant in time, our fluid volume is our material volume, and it's moving with the flow. It's also our control volume, so we choose V of t to be the control volume at this particular time, t. In other words, V t and C V of t are coincident. They occupy the same physical space at time t. We summarize by saying that V of t equals the control volume at time t, and since A of t defines the boundary of this volume V, A of t is the control surface at t. Once we recognize that, we can say that this equation 2 is the Reynolds Transport Theorem. We've completed our derivation of the Reynolds Transport Theorem simply by letting V of t in the Leibniz equation equal our control volume at time t. Sir, that was a very short derivation. In my undergraduate fluids class, my professor spent a whole lecture deriving the Reynolds Transport Theorem. Yes, Boris, I've taught that myself, but this is a much more elegant derivation of the Reynolds Transport Theorem. If you're still a little confused, I summarize the Reynolds Transport Theorem here. Quickly, what we've done is applied Leibniz Theorem to the special case in which V is a material volume. By definition, the material volume always contains the same physical mass of fluid. Ua is equal to U, since the volume moves with the fluid. Vt is a material volume, and we use capital Ds for derivatives. This is now a Reynolds Transport Theorem. Note that U is the absolute velocity of the fluid, Cv is the control volume, and Cs is the control surface. This equation is very general, and the control volume can be moving and distorting in any arbitrary fashion. There's an equivalent form, which I write out here, where this control volume integral is written this way, 
with the integral and the derivative reversed. But if you write it that way, this u is now the relative velocity, not the absolute velocity. Relative velocity is given here, u minus u of the control surface, the fluid velocity relative to the control surface. A simplification of this general Reynolds transport theorem is possible if the control volume is fixed in space then this relative velocity is identical to the absolute velocity. So the Reynolds transport theorem for a fixed control volume is given here, where CV and CS are no longer functions of time. And then we can switch the order of integration and derivative without having to do anything with this term. So these two forms are equivalent. Now let's talk about the usefulness of this Reynolds transport theorem. In any of its forms above, it contains a material volume on the left-hand side, and control volumes and control surfaces on the right-hand side. Thus, the left-hand side is the Lagrangian, or system frame of reference, and the right-hand side is in the Eulerian, or control volume frame of reference. Thus, the Reynolds transport theorem bridges the gap between Lagrangian and Eulerian descriptions, or frames of reference. This is the usefulness of the Reynolds transport theorem. I like to think of it as a link. If this is our system, or Lagrangian frame, and this is our control volume, or Eulerian frame of reference, the Reynolds transport theorem is a link between Lagrangian and Eulerian systems. You can also think of it as bridging the gap between Lagrangian and Eulerian descriptions. With this in mind, we can transform conservation laws, which typically apply directly to Lagrangian material volumes, into Eulerian forms, which is what we like to work with in fluid mechanics. Let's look more closely at this rightmost term in the Reynolds transport theorem. U dot dA is the volume flow rate of fluid crossing area element dA, where here is our control volume with control surface CS and some little element of area whose outward normal is dA, and this is our fluid velocity U. We see from this diagram that U dot dA is positive if u is coming out of the control volume as I sketched here. Similarly, u dot dA is negative if u is in. The phi in this equation is typically a quantity per unit volume. So we let capital phi, or uppercase phi, equal lowercase phi times volume. Then this rightmost integral can be thought of as the net rate of phi times volume, or capital phi, flow out of the control surface. There will be locations where u is out and other locations where u is in, but since the outward flow is positive, this entire integral, again remembering that this circle means we're integrating over the entire control surface, this integral is the net rate of capital phi flow out of the control surface. A quick example, let's let phi equal rho the density, which is mass per volume. Therefore, capital phi is small phi times volume, or just the mass. So this integral, with phi equal rho, is the net rate of mass flow out of the control surface. I always like to check the dimensions. Density gives us mass per volume, which is L cubed. Velocity is L over T, and then area is L squared, using curly brackets as the dimensions of. The L's cancel, and this reduces to mass per time a rate of mass flow, so the dimensions are correct. So in our Reynolds transport theorem, we will always use lowercase phi, but the actual property flowing through is capital phi, lowercase phi times volume. Now let's label the terms in the Reynolds transport theorem. The term on the left is the total rate of change of capital phi following a material volume. This part is the system. This term is the rate of change of capital phi, due to unsteadiness of little phi within the control volume. And this term, as we've already discussed, can be thought of as the rate of change of capital phi due to net outflow of phi through the control surface. Note that this term is zero if the flow is steady, but even for a steady flow, this term won't be zero in general. This is also analogous to when we discussed material derivatives. Again, this left-hand side is the system and the two terms on the right involve the control volume. Or if you prefer, the system is in the Lagrangian framework, and the control volume is in the Eulerian framework. Hopefully you can see that this Reynolds transport theorem bridges the gap between system and control volume.
or between Lagrangian and Eulerian frames of reference. What we're able to do then is take conservation laws, which are fundamentally in a Lagrangian frame, for example, conservation of mass of a system, and then use the Reynolds transport theorem to transform these into the Eulerian frame of reference. For mass, for example, fluid mass moves with the fluid, a material volume. But in the Eulerian method, we can have a fixed control volume with mass flowing in and out. Conservation of mass in the Lagrangian frame is easily changed into the Eulerian frame using the Reynolds transport theorem. Finally, let's think about a moving and or deforming control volume where the general case is that the control volume moves independently of the material volume, in other words, independently of the flow. Again, consider our material volume at some time t, which we also pick to be the control volume at time t. We also have a flow, and we define dA and u, which is the fluid velocity. But ua, the velocity of this little surface element, can be moving in some completely different direction than the flow itself. At some later time, the material volume has moved and distorted, as drawn in blue here. Since it's a material volume, it's moving with the flow. But our control volume can be moving in some arbitrary direction. At that same later time, the control volume has moved someplace else and can distort in any way we want. This is the general case. So what do we do? Well, recall that the 3D Leibniz theorem holds at any instant in time. And since we derive the Reynolds transport theorem from the 3D Leibniz theorem, the Reynolds transport theorem holds at any instant in time also. Again, the key being that we've selected the material volume and the control volume to be the same at time t. And in the general case, u is the absolute velocity of the fluid, independent of what the control volume is doing. So this Reynolds transport theorem is valid for the general case. Finally, we write the Reynolds transport theorem in tensor notation. I copied and pasted the Reynolds transport theorem in vector notation. But recall that in tensor notation, velocity vector is written as ui, and position vector x is written as xi, or xj or xk. We can use any index we want. We'll use j for x and i for u. So phi is a function of xj and time, and the Reynolds transport theorem becomes the equation shown here. The dot product u dot dA is ui daI, and I chose j here for x, so we wouldn't have i repeated three times. There's a free index j in this equation, but that doesn't mean that this is a vector equation. This equation can be a vector, scalar, or a tensor. We're just saying that phi itself is a function of xj and t. Again, phi can be any property we want, and it's capital phi per volume. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.